morning, everybody. Good morning. Happy Easter to you, and we're glad that you're here. And uh, it's always a joy to start off our services and baptisms, and especially on Easter Sunday. Makes it a little bit special, and we've got two folks here today that's going to be baptized, and we're proud of them. Uh, I asked Joseph what I needed to call him when we got in here. And I said, Jojo, Joseph, and he just said, I prefer Joseph. So uh, I'm glad to have Joseph here in the baptistry with us this morning. He got saved at Nana's house. Is that right, Nana? Yeah. And gave his heart to Jesus and wanted to be baptized, and he's been waiting for this day. So let's wait no longer, okay? His profession of faith, I baptize this my brother in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Sylvia here with us. She got saved about a month ago and wanted to be baptized today on Easter Sunday, and I'm proud of her and proud to be able to do that. I baptize this my sister in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Worship our risen Savior. Help our choir to sing. All right, Brother Roger, come here. Amen. Welcome to Black Oak Baptist Church. I wanted to help my breath there a little bit. I pray JoJo might do a cannonball off there. So <laughs> he like she was excited to be here this morning. That's really great. Choir, stand with me. Did you stand with me this morning? Follow along on the screen. We start our worship service.
shout, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the privilege of being here today. We thank you for a risen Savior that allow us to be here today. Thank you for his blood that was shed on Calvary, that we could have life and have a more abundant. We ask that your prayer and blessings be with us today as we continue our service today, Lord. Lead God and direct us. Forgive us where we failed you and come short. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We would like to welcome everyone to Black Oak Baptist Church. Miss Anna is going to play a little melody here. We're going to step out and shake hands. If you're a first-time visitor, we especially want to welcome you. And our pastor is speaking more about that minute. So you step out and shake someone's hand. Make them feel welcome this morning at Black Oak Baptist Church. Would you do that? Well, again, we want to welcome you this morning to the house of the Lord and glad that you're here and uh, praise the Lord for the opportunity to worship Him 
this morning on Easter Sunday. No better day to worship God than the day that He arose. And so we're thankful to be here this morning. I'm going to ask our ushers to make their way down. As they're coming down, if you're visiting with us today for the first time, or maybe for the first time in a long time, right inside of your bulletin is a Connect card. Would you tear that out and give us the information that you're willing to give us? And then the ushers that were, or the greeters that were at the back door when you came in this morning will be there when you leave. Hand them that Connect card and we're going to mail you something about our church, give you some information, tell you what's going on in our church, and uh, let you see what God is doing here at Black Oak. It's come offering time. This is the time that we give back to the Lord. I hope you're being faithful in giving to Him. Uh, one preacher I heard this morning, I was watching some churches who have early services, and one preacher said that he looked at the offering plate and the tomb wasn't the only thing empty. <laughs> Amen. So let's be faithful to give to God this morning and uh, thank Him for what all He's given to us. Hey, we wouldn't have anything if He didn't give it to us to begin with. And, uh, and so this is our way of saying thank you to Him. All right, Heavenly Father, we thank You for this day and we thank You for all that You've given us, all that You've done for us. Lord, You've blessed us and You've been so good to us. And Father, we just want to say thank You. And how much we appreciate you, Lord, we want you to know. Lord, as we gather in this place this morning on Easter Sunday, Father, I pray that our hearts and our minds will be drawn only to you. Uh, God, that our hearts will be lifted up in worship to you. God, that we remember that time that you died on the cross for our sins and the fact that you won the victory over hell and death. Father, we love you this morning. Bless us in this service, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
preach to us this morning. Our choir is going to do a medley of songs for you. Simply entitled, The Blood. Without the precious blood of Jesus, this day would not be possible. That's right. So you think about that this morning, then you think about what our pastor will preach to you just in a few minutes, and you pray for our choir as we get ready to sing for you.
day when heaven was filled with his praises one day when sin was as black as could be jesus came forth to be born of a virgin dwelt among men my example is he word became flesh and Light shined among us, His glory revealed. Living He loved me, dying He saved me, bearing He carried my sins far away. Rising He justified, freely forever. One day He's coming, oh glory.
that cost a life that paid my way death its price when it flowed down from the cross my sins were gone my sins forgot there is a grave that tried to hide this precious blood that gave me life. But in three days he breathed again and rose to stand in my defense. Sights the blind that heals the sick, the lonely finds it has the power to free the bound as chains they fall upon the ground. So pour it out. My soul and let its precious, precious glory flow because He lives to make me whole. I owe my life, I owe my all, and so I. Oh. 
this time we're going to dismiss Jesus, kids. If you'd like your children to go to Children's Church, they're more than welcome to go out the back. Brother Charlie's standing there. If you want them to stay with you this morning, that's quite all right as well. It's going to be hard to preach after singing like that. How do you follow something like that? Amen. That was good, wasn't it? Let's give the choir another hand this morning. They did good. Good singing. Good singing. Uh, I've, I've pastored a few churches but never had a choir that is doing as well as ours. And I've always wondered how, uh, how I'd preach behind a good choir. And so I, I'm a little nervous this morning. <laughs> Uh, to do that but boy it's joy to see you this morning great crowd on a Sunday morning Easter Sunday morning we had sunrise service this morning at seven some of you were here for that wonderful crowd somebody told me they'd been here for a long time so that's probably the biggest crowd we've ever had on a Easter sunrise service and so uh, just a great day to thank the Lord for all he's done and how good he is I know it's April Fool's Day, but it ain't no April Fool. He's alive this morning. Amen. Thank God for that this morning. Would you turn with me to John chapter 20, the book of John chapter number 20. We're actually going to look at an account in Scripture this morning that actually took place after the resurrection. Uh, by this time in John 20, Jesus is already up from the grave. Actually, he's been alive now for about a week or so. Maybe about seven to ten days, and well, I want to see some things that happens in uh, the life of the disciples and in the ministry of Jesus before he goes back to the Father. I mentioned this morning, somebody has asked for over and over, why does Christians make so much of the resurrection? Why is Easter such a big deal? And my answer always is, number one, have you ever seen anybody come out of the grave? So that's one thing. Uh, secondly, I heard a story one time, a little boy was in Sunday school class and the Sunday school teacher asked the student, said, what, what is the resurrection? What is Easter? What is this uh, uh, holiday that we celebrate? And there's, there's silence filled the room and you can tell their little wheels were turning. Finally, one little boy raised his hand. He said, I, I, I know what Easter's all about. I know what Resurrection Sunday is. And the teacher said, what is it? And he said, I believe that's the day that Jesus came out of the grave and saw a shadow and went back in. <laughs> hey, Lord. Uh, he did come out of the grave, but he didn't go back in. i tell you that this morning. Praise God. I want to preach on the subject this morning, the story behind the scars. Why are they there? Uh, we're going to see an account today in the Word of God where one of the disciples said he wouldn't believe Jesus had resurrected unless he'd seen the scars. And I want us to look at this really on a personal level. Why are those scars there? Why did he have to go through what he went through? John 20, stand with me, would you, as we read the Word of God? John chapter 20. We'll begin in verse number 26. Now, the disciples had gathered many times up to this point. Uh, their master had been crucified. They saw him die. They've come together on a couple of occasions. And now we find them in verse 26. The Bible says, And after eight days again, his disciples were within. And Thomas was with them. Then came Jesus. By the way, when Jesus shows up, something's going to happen. I'm just going to tell you. The doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger and behold my hands. Reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. By the way, when you get a hold of Jesus, it will change you. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas... Because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, yet believed. Heavenly Father, I pray God this morning you speak to our hearts. Lord, how the songs have just lifted us up into your presence. And God, it has brought us to a place now that we could just dive into your word. And I pray this morning as 
We look into your word that you speak to our hearts. God, I pray that uh, lives will be changed this morning. Hearts uh, that are carrying burdens will be lifted. And all that is done will be to glorify your high and holy name. We love you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You could be seated. May the 9th, 2008, became one of the most devastating days for a young army private by the name of Hunter Levine. Hunter Levine was driving a Humvee in East Baghdad doing what he had been ordered to do many times over and over again when all of a sudden a roadside bomb went off going through the windshield of the Humvee. The hot metal sliced his jaw from one side to the other. Other pieces of metal went into his face and into his eyes. Hunter Levine didn't know what hit him until a few days later when he woke up in an army hospital. He was blind in both eyes and his face cut from one side to the other. Many of his friends, after he healed from the accident, they wanted him to travel the country. They said, Hunter, you ought to tell your story. You ought to travel around and tell what happened to you and how your life's been changed by it. And Hunter made the comment, he said, there's no way anyone can stomach my story. And so some friends got together and they ended up helping him tell his story on a website. You can go to it today called heartsforhunter.com. And on that website, Hunter tells his story of what happened that day in East Baghdad. And because of that website that was launched for him to tell his story, several other thousands of soldiers have been able to launch their own websites telling their stories of what happened in the war. Hunter ended up dying June of 2013 of a heart attack while visiting some army friends down in Florida. But what he did is he gave a platform in which others could tell the story behind their scars. In John chapter 20 this morning, on two separate occasions actually, Jesus shows up with his scars to his disciples and begins to tell a story. Thomas, one of the disciples, was a little skeptic about the resurrection. He, he knew Jesus had died, but yet he was a little bit uncertain about uh, this whole resurrection thing. Did it really happen? But when he saw the scars, his heart was moved. And the Bible tells us in verse 28, when his heart was moved, that he uh, proclaimed, my Lord and my God. I submit to you this morning that those who are willing to listen, the scars of our living Lord are still speaking today. I submit to you this morning, those who are willing to listen, the scars of our Lord are still telling a powerful message. What is the story behind the scars? What do they tell us today? Well, number one, his scars inform us. On the evening of the resurrection, Jesus shows up and he meets his disciples. He's telling them and he's showing them that he's alive. He knows they're gathered together there in Galilee, so he shows up in their midst and he says, Here I am, boys. I'm alive and well. But if you still have your Bibles open, look what verse 24 says of that same chapter we were in. But Thomas, remember, old doubting Thomas? But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So here they are gathered. Thomas isn't with them. Jesus shows up. He says, here I am. I'm alive. I'm well. Uh, Ta-da. Uh, he played April Fool's joke on the devil, and he showed up alive and well. But Thomas was not there. He was not there to see the living Lord. So when the other disciples get with Thomas, they try to tell him, hey, our Lord's alive. Jesus is risen from the dead. We've seen him with our eyes. But Thomas tells them, I'm not going to believe until I could see it for myself. I'm not going to believe unless I could touch the scars in his hands. I'm not going to believe unless I can thrust my fist in his side. For Thomas, the wounds of Jesus would provide evidence and information that he needed to believe. The weakness of Thomas's faith aside, there's still a sense in which the scars of Jesus provide us with some valuable information. Maybe some this morning are here, maybe just to see a baptism, or it's Easter Sunday, I, I better go to church because it's Easter. And maybe in your mind, somewhere you wonder, is this thing really real? 
Well, what does his scars inform us of? Well, number one, it informs us of his suffering. He suffered desperately on the cross. Luke 23, 33 says, And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. A woman wrote Dr. J. Vernon McGee one time and said, Dr. McGee said, uh, my pastor got up this past Sunday and said that Jesus really didn't die on the cross. He was just swooned. And later he came out of that a coma-like state and uh, that's how he came out of the grave. What do you think of that, Mr. Uh, McGee? Well, J. Vernon wrote back and said this, Dear Madam, I want you to take a leather whip to your church this coming Sunday and beat your pastor 39 times. And then I want you to nail him to a cross and hang him in the sun for about six hours. And then I want you to run a spear through his side. Then I want you to embalm him and put him into an airless tomb. And three days later, let's see what happens to him. <laughs> hey, Jesus died an awful death. His, his scars inform us of his suffering. Think about that cross for a moment. Think about the awful pain, the excruciating, brutal beatings he took, the scourgings he took. And there they laid his body on the cross and uh, they nailed him to that tree. They would take something like a railroad spike and they would hammer it through the tendons and the bones uh, of his wrist about an inch or two from his hands. And then after they had nailed his hands to the cross, they would take another spike and they would drive that spike through the Achilles joint of his feet, sending uh, equally sharp pain uh, up his legs and into his lower back. Uh, there on the cross, like shoes of fire, uh, pain ran up and down the nervous system of our Lord Jesus Christ. And there he hung. They picked the cross up as they portrayed just a few minutes ago. They picked the cross up from the ground. And if you can, you can hear it thump into the hole that was already prepared there. And when it thumped, his body caves in a little bit. And all the pain continues to shoot. But you see, it wasn't the spikes that killed him on the cross. The crucifixion was not uncommon uh, in that day, in Bible days. It happened many times, but the, 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 the spikes would not have killed him. The wounds would not usually be fatal. You see, what happened really to the victim on the cross is they died from suffocation. They would hang there for so long that uh, their uh, joints and their bodies would begin to hurt and uh, he would begin to feel a crushing pain, Jesus would, in his chest as the pericardium, the, the sac around the heart, began to fill up with serum and it began to compress his heart. And at this point, his heart is sluggish and it's trying to pump that heavy, thick blood into his tissues. And then his tired lungs begin to frantically <gasps> gasp for breath. And <gasps> he would hang there with spikes through his hands and through his feet, a uh, crown of thorns on his head. He had been whipped 39 times, blood pouring from his body. And his heart's trying to keep up and his lungs are trying to keep up. And there he would die from suffocation. Some eight days after this agonizing death, Thomas gazes still into those open wounds. Jesus has resurrected and Thomas gazes at those wounds and it reminded him of the torture that the Lord experienced. Dear friend, let me say to you this morning, the Lord went through all that not only for Thomas, he went through it for Lee Hickman, he went through it for Josh Wilcox, he went through it for every man, woman, boy and girl in this place. You're watching by a, a computer this morning God did it and he sent his son for you that suffering was for everyone that would come to him by faith and accept him as Lord and Savior them scars inform of his, uh, of us, of his suffering but the scars also inform us of his success what do you mean by that preacher I mean he died but he got up again hmm <laughs> Uh, he died, but he resurrected. Jesus stood there before Thomas with his scarred hands outstretched. His wounds spoke of his death, but the fact that he was standing there spoke that he got up. 
The fact that he was right there in front of Thomas told Thomas not only did he suffer the pains of death, but he overcome the pains of death. They may have put him down, but praise God, he got back up. The Lord Jesus took those scarred hands and he seized the death by the throat and he crushed it with all that was in him. He who said, I am the resurrection and the life, proved it three days after they hung him on the cross. He came out of the grave. He's alive this morning. Every Sunday we meet at church to celebrate the fact that he's alive. You see, in Jewish times, in their custom, they would have their Lord's Day on, the, on Saturday. Then why do we do it on Sunday, preacher? To celebrate that first day of the week that our Savior got up when they put him down. He came alive when they killed him. Dear friend, we're here this morning, but I'm telling you, every Sunday morning we meet in this place, we can celebrate. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. Praise God. There's about 138,000 words in the New Testament of the Bible, but three of the most precious words you'll ever find is He is risen, praise God. Uh, he's alive this morning. He uh, came out successful over those scars. He came out successful over the grave. He came out successful over the pain He went in. He is God and He's alive this morning. What do those wounds say to us? They inform us he suffered a terrible, horrible death on a Roman cross. But they also tell us that he succeeded in conquering death and getting up out of the grave. Oh, this is good. I'm glad I came here to hear myself say what I'm about to say. <laughs> Easter is the day... That death died. <laughs> whoop, whoop, that's good. <laughs> Easter is the day that death died, praise God. I wonder what happened that day when Jesus came out of the grave. You know, spiritually speaking, the Bible don't speak to this. This is the gospel according to Lee Hickman. This is just my sanctified imagination working here. What happened? During those days when Jesus died until he came out of the grave. I, I wonder. Jesus dies. He uh, commends his spirit to the Father. And he gives up the ghost. He died. Okay. I don't care what any philosopher tells you. He died. Alright. His mama said he was dead. Pilate said he was dead. The soldiers said he was dead. He didn't go into coma and they didn't put him on life support. He died that day, okay? And I think during, on that first day, Mr. Death struts down uh, from the Calvary's mountain down into the lowest pits of hell and he tells Satan, he says, Satan, we got him. I took care of him. You were worried about that old boy Satan, but he don't have nothing on me. He said, uh, Mr. Satan, just remember, every prince that's ever lived has came through my cold, dead hands. Every king who's ever ruled a nation has went through my cold, lifeless fingers. And none of them has been fixed. Day two rolls around. Mr. Death goes by the tomb. He looks in. There lays Jesus. And he comes strolling, strutting back down into that lowest parts of hell. And Satan said, well, you still look awful happy. He said, I am. He said, and you ought to be too. He said, the thing is over. The man gave empty promises to people. He's no resurrection. He's no life. He's no truth. He's no way. Nothing. I've got it. But then the third day rolled around. Mr. Death takes a stroll down there through the garden. He walks up to the tomb and he looks in the tomb. And there's no body to be found. Mr. Death begins to shake a little bit. His knees begin to knock and he kind of walks down into the lowest parts of hell with his head kind of hung low and kind of slow and Satan says, wait a minute, boy. You look a little bit different today than 
what you have been the past few days. He said, I know, I know, I know. He said, uh, Satan, listen. He said, I, I had him and I got him and he was all mine. He said, but I declare this morning I walked by that tomb and I, I smelt the lily of the valley bloom. Uh, I declare this morning, uh, devil, that I had him, but he told me to let go. And I couldn't do nothing about it. What are you trying to tell me, Mr. Death? I'm trying to tell you, devil, he's back. (laughs) That's what Easter is all about. If I could write you a headline this morning and write it uh, on the New York column, it'd simply be this. He is empty. The tomb is empty. He is alive. The scars inform us that he suffered. But they also inform us he succeeded over death and hell. But I want to show you another thing the scars tell us. The scars also indict us. Hmm. Thomas had been a skeptic now. He had stubbornly refused to believe the testimony of ten of his closest friends. He had missed the meeting prior in John chapter 20, and he just stubbornly refused to believe the Lord was alive unless he could see it for himself. Then about a week after the resurrection, Thomas found himself looking directly at the living Lord. He looked at him eye to eye and his wounds serving as a mark of his identity. No doubt as Thomas struggled to see through the tears of mixed emotion, there was a a feeling of conviction in his heart for failing to believe. Maybe in his heart Thomas thought, you know what, I, I, I should have believed it. He said he is going to get up. He told us if they tear his temple down in three days, he would build it up again. He told us it was I should have just believed. Those scars, as glorious as they were, were no doubt indictments upon the hard heart of Thomas. Likewise, there is a sense in which the scars of Jesus convict us as well. Today we celebrate his death and his resurrection. We also view those scars a little bit as they prick our hearts. Why, preacher? Because we had a role in those scars. There's a reason those scars were in his hand. There's a reason there was a scar in his feet and one in his side. You see, we played a role in those scars. Perhaps Thomas uh, looked at those holes in Christ's hands and he remembered how he and the rest of the disciples had abandoned the Lord when he got arrested. And he thought, oh man, I, I, I shouldn't have done that. Maybe Thomas viewed that open side of Christ and remembered that part he played in the Lord's death. But the reality is this morning, all of us sitting here in this place played a part in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. 700 years before Jesus would die, the prophet Isaiah would say this, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. And we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. There on the cross, the shoulders of Jesus became as a giant altar. And the sins of the world, yours and mine, was laid there on the altar of the Lord Jesus. There on the cross, our Lord's heart became as a cesspool and all the putrid, polluted sins of all the world went in to Him. Why did He do it? So that we may know Him in freedom. That we may know Him in salvation. If we understand that Jesus died for our sins, then we must know that His scars should have been our scars. He died in our place. He was executed for the laws of God that we broke. Therefore, the cross on which he died was actually our cross. 
That cross that he was now to 2,000 years ago uh, on Jerusalem's hillside should have been the cross Lee Hickman hung on. It's my fault he's there. It's your fault he's there. The great preacher from yesteryear, W.A. Criswell, tells of a dream he had one time. Criswell woke up that next morning and he began to write down the dream. It troubled him so bad. He said, in a dream I saw the Savior. His back was bare and there was a soldier lifting his hand to bring down that awful cat of nine tails. What's the cat of nine tails, preacher? That's the whip they used to lash his back. It was a whip made out of several straps of leather and in that leather was wrapped up pieces of metal and pieces of bone so when they would rip, whip him on the back the metal and that bone would uh, pierce his back and when they would pull back on the whip it would rip off skin as it came off. Chris Wells said, I saw a soldier with that cat of nine tails whipping the back of Jesus, skin flying everywhere, blood splattering on people as they stood around and watched. He said, I couldn't take it anymore. He said, and in my dream, I rose up and I grabbed that soldier by the arm to hold him back. But when I did, he said, in astonishment, that soldier turned around and looked at me. And when I looked at him, I recognized myself. He said, I was the soldier whipping the back of Jesus. I was a soldier nailing those nails in his hands. Those scars of Jesus, they indict us because we understand that our sins, each and every individual in this world, their sins played a role in causing those scars. They tell us who we are. That we're sinners in need of a Savior. I wasn't there to swing that whip upon his back or drop the hammer of nails into his hands. I didn't drive the spear into the heart physically. But nevertheless, it was my lust. It was my lies. It was my greed and my gossip, my selfishness, my sinfulness that crucified the Lamb of God. And so I have to come before God and say, I'm guilty. I'm guilty. Not only did we play a role in those scars, there's a response we must give to those scars. Rather than celebrating the atonement of his death and the victory of his resurrection, we see Thomas had become discouraged, disillusioned. This was my master. Why would he die? I thought he was supposed to live forever. His faith in the Messiah was drowned in the sea of doubt as he heard of his Lord's death. No doubt mixed with the joy of seeing Jesus alive, there was in the heart of Thomas that night a shadow of conviction for how he initially responded to the wounds of Jesus. Like Thomas, every one of us are going to have to respond to the wounds of Jesus. Every one of us are going to have to make a decision. Will we come before God and admit our guilt? Or will we in doubt, turn him away. There on the cross, Jesus bore the sins of all the world, including mine and including yours. I read a story one time. It was awful interesting to me. It's about a Vietnam veteran who was killed in action. I read the story, and it said that there was one soldier who was hurt in action. He, he had been wounded somehow in action. And, and, and one of his... Uh, partners heard his cries for help and he ran and he picked up his partner and carried him on his shoulders back towards camp. And right before they got to camp, the, the soldier that was carrying the friend was shot in the back and killed instantly. The gentleman that was initially wounded survived and was honorably discharged from the war and about a year or so after that event took place back at home in the community that the dead soldier lived in they wanted to throw a celebration for his life after hearing what he had done to save the young man during the celebration of his life the, the community had gathered in the young soldier who had initially been wounded that was carried on that dead soldier's back showed up to the party to celebrate the life 
of the man that saved him. The only problem was that young soldier was drunk. He was cussing. He was rowdy. He, he was making a scene of himself after everyone left and the family was the only one left. The mother of the soldier who had been killed began to cry. And she asked the question, why would my son die for somebody like that? You've got to ask yourself this morning, why would Jesus die for somebody like me? As sinful as I am, as selfish as I am, why would he do that? When you look at the scars of Jesus, we think about our own lives and how we've lived. And we ask the question, why would God's son die for somebody like me? His wounds indict us all because our sin is what caused him to go to that cross. It's been said time and time again, but I'll say it again this morning. It wasn't the nails that held him to that cross. It was his love for sinners that held him to that cross. None of us have lived worthy of his sacrifice. The story behind his scars, they inform us of his suffering and his success over the grave. Them scars indict us. They, it shows that we played a role in them and we should have a response to them. But thirdly, his scars ensure us. Look in verse 28 again if you still have your Bibles open. G Thomas sees Jesus. Thrust, he, he puts his finger in the hand of Jesus. He thrusts his fist in his side. And Thomas is overcome with emotion in verse 28. And answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. The sight of the wounds of Jesus shored up that once doubtful heart of Thomas. There was something assuring about the message in those scars. Likewise, dear friends, the wounds of Jesus ensure all of us today. Though we cannot see him as Thomas did, by faith we can look and know that there was a purpose he went to the cross, and that was for us. That was so that I could be saved and you can be saved. Look at the place where those scars are seen. In verse 29, the Bible says, Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou believe. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. You and I today don't have the opportunity that Thomas had. We can't physically right now examine the wounds and scars of Jesus Christ. However, just because we can't see them doesn't mean they aren't still there. In fact, there is a place where those scars of Jesus can still be seen this very moment. Hebrews 9, 12 says, After he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, he now sits down at the right hand of God. Right now, seated by the right hand of his Father in the throne of heaven. Right now, the angels of glory are giving him praise and the saints who have died before us, they are singing songs to the Lamb of God and they can still clearly see the holes and the opening of his hands and his side. One person has said it well. The only thing man made in heaven are the scars in Jesus' body. Those wounds are still seen in that place. Those wounds are still there. Let me ask you a question this morning. Do you love him? Let me ask you the next question. Do you love him enough that you would give your life over to him and say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Come into my life be my Lord and Savior. Do you have the promise of heaven forever? Let me show you very quickly the purpose his scars are serving. In John chapter 20, Jesus presented his wounds to his disciples. Why? As evidence... That he was alive. Hey, look, this is me. This ain't somebody filling in. This ain't a stand in. This is me. Look at my wounds. I submit to you this morning, Jesus is still presenting those wounds for a different reason and to a different audience. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25 says, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing that he ever liveth. To make intercession 
for them. What does that mean? It means Jesus talks to the Father on your behalf. Satan comes before God and he says, God, look down there at Lee Hickman. He's broken your law. He has a filthy mind. He's done all these wrong things. By your law, he deserves death. And Jesus looks over at the Father and shows him the wounds. And as the choir sung earlier, I can now stand before you and say the blood covers it all. He cleansed me from all of my sin. Do I deserve it? No. Could I pay for it? No. Can I do anything to earn it? No. But simply coming to Him by faith. Trusting Him as Savior. His blood washes all of my sin away. The Bible says that He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. A Roman soldier comes home from war hundreds of years ago, hears that his brother is on trial for his life. The soldier walks into the courtroom and he lifts the nubs that used to be his arms, begin to wave them at the judge, and the judge's heart was moved. And he pardoned that young man. You and I deserve the death penalty this morning. You and I deserve death. But when we come to Jesus by faith, He shows the wounds to the Father. And we get set free. And Jesus said, whoever the Son sets free, is free indeed. Fanny Crosby is probably one of my favorite hymn writers. She lived blind from the time she was an infant. And there was a story of a conversation she had with a friend of hers that caused her to end up writing one of her famous hymns. The story went that the friend and her were talking one day, and the friend asked Fanny Crosby, said, Fanny, do you think you'll ever be able to recognize anyone in heaven, being that you've never been able to see your mom or your dad or your friends, me, anybody? Do you think you'll be able to recognize anybody in heaven? Fanny responded, you know, I've wondered that for a long time. She said, I've wondered how an old lady who's been blind most of her life could even recognize one person, including her Lord and Savior. She said, I've thought on it, and I've thought on it, and I've thought on it, and here's what I think. Fanny said, whenever I get to heaven, I'm going to look around, and I'm going to see folks, folks I've probably known, but I may not recognize them. She said, and I'm going to look around and look around. And she said, and finally when I find the person that I think is my Savior, I'm going to walk up to him and I'm just going to simply ask, can I see your hands? And she said, as soon as I see the nail prints in his hands, I'm going to know that's my Jesus. Fanny ended up writing a hymn based on that conversation. Let me read you just a line of it. She said, when my life's work is ended and I cross the swelling tide, when the bright and glorious morning I shall see, I shall know my Redeemer when I reach the other side, and His smile will be the first welcome to welcome me. I shall know Him, I shall know Him, when redeemed by His side I shall stand. I shall know Him, I shall know Him by the nail prints in His hand. One day, those who have repented and come to Christ to be saved will see Him face to face. And when we do, we too will have the privilege of seeing those scars. And at that moment, they will speak to us again, even as they do today. And we'll bow down before Him. And like Thomas, I believe we will say, My Lord and my God. Church, that's the story behind the scars let's pray this morning if you're here this morning and you've never accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior then I'm going to invite you today to do that listen you could be saved by coming to the altar you could be saved sitting right there where you're at right there Jesus can save you preacher I don't know what to pray I don't know how to pray. 
You know, I remember as a nine-year-old boy when I gave my life to Christ, the only thing I can remember saying is this, Lord, I, rem- I-, I know that I'm a sinner, and I know that I need to be saved. Would you come into my heart and my life save me? Take me to heaven when I die. And I could stand before you this morning and say that night on the left-hand side of that couch in the living room of the home where I grew up, the Lord Jesus came into my life, saved me. And if I were to die today, I know without a doubt heaven would be my home. Maybe this morning you need to pray a, a prayer similar to what I just said. Why don't you say it right there where you're sitting this morning? Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that without you I won't go to heaven. Hell will be my eternal home. And I know that you died for me. So this morning I want to make you Savior of my life and Lord of my life. Come to my heart. If you've prayed a prayer similar to that, then in just a moment, I'm going to invite you to come. I'm going to be standing right here in the middle. I want to talk to you. Maybe there was one of you that prayed a prayer similar to that. Maybe there was multiple people who did. But no matter how many of you did, I want you to come. Because I want to talk to you just for a moment. Tell you what it means to be a Christian. Tell you what it means to walk with God on a daily basis. Maybe here and you know you're saved, you know heaven's your home, but you're not walking worthy of that salvation. Like Thomas, you are doubting a few things, and like Thomas, you are you're walking at a sinful distance from God. And on Easter Sunday morning, you want to come and make things right. Say, Heavenly Father, you know I've not been living like I've been ought to have been living. You know I've not been doing like I ought to have been doing. Forgive me. And with arms wide open, He'll bring you right back home. He'll bring you right back home. So I'm going to ask Christians this morning to lead the way to the altar. Maybe you're just carrying a burden or something that's in your life and you want to drop it off at the feet of Jesus. I'm going to ask you to lead the way to the altar. And then as Christians begin to come, if you're here and you prayed a prayer to ask Jesus into your heart, I want you to just follow in behind the Christians that are leading the way, okay? Come up here let me talk to you for a minute. Maybe you're here and you say, hey preacher, this is the church I want to join. I want to get plugged in on what God's doing at Black Oak Baptist in Clinton, Tennessee. Then I want you to come forward as well. I'll be here to talk to you. Others will be here to talk to you. We want you to get plugged in and join in to what God is doing. There's a story behind his scars and we're all involved in it. Every one of us in this place. The question is, what will we do? And how will we respond to those scars? Heavenly Father, I pray this morning in the mighty, precious name of Jesus for men and women and boys and girls that are in this place that need to be saved or got saved this morning already, Father, I pray that they step out by faith and they come and publicly proclaim you as their Lord. God, I pray for Christians who need to come that need to do business with you, maybe need to drop off burdens. God, for Christians who may have lost family members that want to come and in a spirit of intercession pray for those lost family members, they be saved for it's too late. God, that you know every heart in this place. And you're speaking to every heart in this place. And Father, as you speak to us, we come to you right now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand. We're going to begin to sing. Would you come?